Good morning, my friends. Good morning. Good morning. You're getting us in the season already. I like it, though. Right. Um, before we get started, I would like to, those of you that were interested in the Friday night Bible study, we're going to begin this week. I decided to postpone it until this coming Friday night because I wanted to explain to you what it actually is briefly. It's not going to be a typical Bible study where we just sit together and I talk and you listen. Um, the studies are going to be very interactive. They're going to do two things. They're going to tear two things apart. The first thing we're going to do as a group, how many of you show up? As a group, we're going to go back into the wheel of faith and tear apart the word, the plan of salvation, piece by piece. And the second thing we're going to tear apart is ourselves. I have no intention on just leading out in a talk. I plan on it being very interactive between um, us and the Holy Spirit. There will be things that you have to do during the week to prepare for the lesson on Friday. And we will talk about it. We will discuss how it impacted you, how, how it felt. And I do not intend on moving until you have an experience with God. That is the idea. That you begin to experience God in deeper ways. And actually have this experience. If you're converted already, fine. We're going to get deeper in the conversion. If you're not, this is the place to be. And so we're going to spend um, some quality time, about an hour together. And I pray that uh, you consider coming. Because it's going to be a, a different way of reading the Bible together. So having said that, you know where we've been two and a half months discussing the will of faith. Two and a half months of looking at the gospel, and we looked at how the law works together with the gospel to keep us in that faith relationship. We looked at how the Sabbath works together with the gospel. Now, this morning, I hope that you thought of your creator, your redeemer, your sanctifier, and the one that's coming back to bring you to his kingdom. Well, today we're going to look at a third thing. It's going to be in three parts uh, for the next three weeks. We're going to look at... There is something else that we have been giving to keep us in the will of faith. Something else that uh, you know it already. It's called the relationship. But that's a watered down word. We're going to look at how our relationship with him should look. And if it's in the right way, it will keep us in a faith relationship with him. It will keep that will of faith spinning in our lives very positively and consistently. So we're going to look at this one thing that God can't do for us. There's one thing that He cannot do for us. And that is that God cannot seek the relationship with Him for us. Does that make sense? He cannot do that. He can do a whole lot of things. He can cover us with His righteousness. He can save us. He can send the Holy Spirit. But He cannot seek a relationship for Himself with us for us. It is something that the Scripture is extremely clear on. That the relationship must be sought for by us. Look, Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says this, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. Right? We could say it this way. You must like his Facebook page. We must respond to his shares. Right? We've got to share the things. We've we got to interact with him just like you would on your phone. Meet McGuire, one of the greats of our past history in this church from the 20s and 30s. He wrote that we cannot underestimate this. That the relationship with God must be sought after as we would any other relationship. I get these Facebook things all the time, just like all of you do. If you really like me, please show by liking my page. Or if you're really my friend, please retweet this out. And I always laugh at that. Like, hey, dude, I'm your friend, but I don't got the time to go. <laughs> but that's not so with God. It's not so with Jesus. If we want a relationship with him, we must respond. With something much more than just a little thumbs up that floats up on the page. We're going to look at what that is. John, the fifth chapter, tells us. The 15th chapter of John is the chapter known as abiding in Christ. And it's basically simply what we would call the relationship with Him. And how this relationship is to be characterized and what it will do for our relationship with the will of faith. John chapter 15, verse 1 through 5, he says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he proves that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. Now the word in Greek that it uses for abide is the word mino. And mino is written in the imperative tense. And it means that in the imperative tense, the subject is understood. What it is saying is you abide in me, exclamation mark. And in this tense, it means that you, the action is upon you to abide. And if you take the action to abide, then he reciprocates the relationship. And so it becomes imperative to understand the imperative. What does John mean? If you're looking at steps to Christ, we would be going over the next three weeks, chapter 9, 10, and 11. Today, chapter 9. There's only three things that we've been ever given to do that we've got to do with all our heart, soul, and mind. If we want the relationship to grow, if we want to stay in a faith relationship, many of you made many commitments over the past two and a half months. Some of you with Dr. Nedley made commitments and already they're beginning to fade out of your mind. Already you're not doing what you thought that I need to be doing. Well, here's how you can do what you've said I'm going to do. John chapter 15 says this. Verse 7. You abide in me and my words abide in you. It's the first thing that we've been told to do. What's another, another term for the word words that we would say? Oh, yeah. The Bible. The word of God is the first way we foster the relationship. The word of God is the way that we stay in the faith relationship. It's the way we keep the wheel of faith spinning in the book Steps to Christ. Do you ask, how am I to abide in Christ? In the same way as you received him at first. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So you are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but look to Christ. Let the mind dwell upon his love, his beauty, his perfection, his character. Christ in his self-denial, Christ in his humiliation, Christ in his purity, his holiness, Christ in his matchless love. This is the subject for the soul's contemplation it is by loving him, copying him, and depending wholly upon him that you are to be transformed into his life. And through his word, John says, is the first way we come to abide in Christ. Psalm 119, verse 105 says it like this. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. Thy light is my path. I want you to think about that. That gets by us because we know it so much. Have you ever had to have a light to your feet? When I first moved to Louisiana, when I left here many moons ago, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, I moved to Louisiana. And when I was down there, I was a country boy from Tarkington Prairie, flatlands. There's no creeks down there. But in Louisiana, there's nothing but creeks. And nothing but bayous and swamps, the part that we lived in that was where Wiscachita River was. And they told me, look, when you go out down to the Whiskey Chit and you're going to go down to the creek, do not jump the creek. Don't cross the creek or you'll get lost. <laughs> and there were these um, Indian mounds out there where you could dig down into these hills and find little stones and arrowheads. And I was so excited and set out with my shovel and I was going to go find some Indian hills. And I'm digging around and looking and then I see one across the creek and I jump the creek and, and I see another one and I go a little bit further and I cross the creek again to get to another one. And pretty soon I, I said, man, it's getting late. The sun looks like it's about to set. And I look up and I have, it just dawned on me that I have no clue where I am. <laughs> now, where I live, the Wiscachita uh, Basin, it went out just into hundreds of miles of swamp. And I realized it was getting dark and I was lost. So I started trying to, to, to 
find my way back and everything looks the same in the swamp. Every tree, every every tributary of water, every little, I'm looking for anything. Oh yeah, I remember that tree. And I, and I go over here and nope, that tree led me further and further out. And what was getting worse was it was getting darker and darker and then it was pitch black. And I'm out in the middle of a swamp. We didn't have no cell phone back then with the light on it. And the water was ankle deep. And that place was crawling with copperheads and water moccasins and who knows what else. And I was swishing through the water. Going, I'm just fixing to get it any moment. And I was terrified. And I walked what seemed like for hours, feeling my way around, didn't know what to do. And then, God in heaven, off in the distance, I saw a light. A vague little glimmering light. It was miles away, and I, when I made my way and wound through the creek, ended up on the other side of Sugartown Highway, miles from my house. I had circled back around. I don't know how I did it, but ended up on the highway, walked all the way back home. That's what David is trying to say. The word of God is a lamp in the swamp, the dark swamps of the world. And you think about, we, there's a lot of talk about the millennial generation today. There's a lot of talk about all the different things that you can believe out there. And surely you can turn on politics and get lost in the swamp of politics today. You can get all caught up on who's doing this or what's going on. You can get caught up in the world of sports, the world of money, your jobs. You can go to our colleges and universities and you're going to hear that God don't exist. Genesis isn't real. Uh, the book of Exodus is all messed up. The world is a swamp when it comes to information. Some of it's true, part of it's true, maybe most of it's not true. Who knows of all the stuff that comes into our minds that forms our thoughts and our character. And yet, the Word of God becomes a beacon, a light, something that we are to gravitate toward to guide us through the swamp that we call life and the information that's coming into our minds from mentors, from teachers, from Facebook, from the internet, from music, through Hollywood, through well-meaning people. I mean, it is just a, a deluge of words. And if you don't have the anchor of God's word, there is no telling which wind of direction you'll be blown in in this world. God's word is powerful. I, I've been watching something. Uh, Brother Ted turned me on to this documentary called uh, Patterns of Evidence. And Mary last night, I was standing up on my seat, you know, because they say right today in the secular world, it's why most of our kids probably don't believe in the Bible. They go to a secular college, they're going to get inundated with this idea that Exodus didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. It's in the, it's, there was no Jews in the 13th century in Egypt. And this whole documentary is about back it up 200 years and go into the right century, the 15th century, and you're fine. They're finding all this archaeological evidence. And then I was like, oh, my, that's Joseph. That is Joseph. There's a picture. There's a statue. That is Joseph. And those 11 tombs are his brothers. And I was used to my skin. I knew the goosebumps was popping up. And, and then they, they show, well, then, then at this particular time, we can't explain it, but Egypt just has a collapse and they're overtaken by the Hyksos rulers. I'm like, that's because the ten plagues and all their army was drowned in the sea. And all of these descriptions they're finding in archaeology 200 years before, I was just listening to all this and I was just going to bed last night. I decided to put my audio Bible back on. And I put the word of God. I wanted to listen to the Exodus again with all this new information I had in my head. And I went to bed and I was so excited again. I was so excited. I woke up this morning. I had this just sense of like, you know, my life's a mess right now. I'm stuck down in Trinity trying to sell a house, trying to, trying to buy a home over here in Conroe. And my life has just got all kind of problems and stuff. And I, and I woke up this morning. And I said, look, man, God is real. He spoke to this man named Joseph. Amen. We got evidence out there. That the Red Sea did split, that the plagues did fall, that the Egyptians were conquered, that Joseph, that Jacob, and these men were real men that God spoke to. And Joshua was real. They got evidence of this conquest. And that word of God just swooshed around in my head all night, and I woke up this morning, and I just had this feeling in my heart that he's real, and he can handle my problems. That God that looks like so long ago, 3,400 years ago in the Exodus, is the same God today orchestrating events in this church. Amen. That sanctuary out there we want to build, it ain't nothing to Him. When the time is right, the problems in my life, there ain't nothing to Him. 
And that is what the word can do when you ingest it, when you read it, when you contemplate upon it, when you meditate upon it. It gets down in there and it does something. We forget what Hebrews 4 is trying to tell us. I want to read it to you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Well, how many times have I heard this? And I'm like, okay. The word of God is sharp and powerful. We need two-edged sword. Oh, no, no, no. You got to read Hebrews 4.12. Well, the word of God is living. Stop right there. What does that mean? I don't know. I know the word in Greek. It's zoe. But I don't understand what that quite means. But it means something more than what I think it means. It is alive. Amen. It's not a dead letter. This is not Shakespeare. This is not the works of Homer. This isn't just the ink on, on pages. This is a living thing in some mysterious way that we do not understand. But it is alive and it is powerful. The word dunamis. It is dynamite. It is not static. It is not old. It is dead. It is alive. It's powerful. And it has the capacity to get into the human mind and do things. For it is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is able, as it says, to cut right through the human heart. That's what it's saying. Right into the issues of life and speak to you where you are and help you. That's why John says, if you want to abide in me, let my words abide in you. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God and that word came and dwelt among men. And when that word left, he left his word behind and that word is still the word. And yet our kids, an interesting study done on what is going on in America. The fastest growing religion in America is not the Seventh-day Adventist church. It is not Islam. It is the occult fastest growing religion in America. And I read an article on why that is. And they're linking it directly to the, to the birth of the Harry Potter series. And since the Harry Potter series, if you've noticed with Disney, which they've always been a kind of this way, but even more so now in all Hollywood, is spewing out nothing but sorcery, magic, and spells. And our young kids, especially teenage girls from the age of 12 to 15, are the most vulnerable. There is power in the idea of magic and sorcery. It's, it's seductive. It's something that we're, we're mystically inclined to because it's the arcane. It's, it's the other world that we want to get out of this dead world and get to a, another world. And that is why it is so prolific everywhere. Now, Little Light Ministries does a great job on talking about why this is happening, what's going on. It's a phenomenon that's just sweeping across America and also Western Europe. They had an interview with a man on it's the, the, se the segment, is, I think, is Battlefield Hollywood. And they did an inter interview with this man that is an avowed Wiccan and a very intelligent man. And he said, you know what magic really is, what we call magic? He said magic or witchcraft or whatever you want to call it, it was really referred to in the old days as the art. The idea of what is art. And the word spells, where we cast a spell, is just the word, the idea of letters and words. Magic is nothing more than words. And he talked about the power of words in art which is in music, which is in literature, which is in uh, whether it's a statue that's being carved, a painting, a movie, a play. That's all art. It's all the communication of words. And words are nothing more but trying to put together sentences which form thoughts. And when you use lying, deceiving words, that is magic in its fullest sense. It has the power to change your thoughts and your thoughts, Dr. Nedley, right? When your thoughts drive your feelings or your feelings drive your thoughts, it drives your character and that makes who you are. What did Satan do to Eve? He cast a spell on her by simply saying, has God really said? And that swished around in her brain. 
and it changed everything. Words are powerful. Psychologically, we can prove this without religion at all. They are the most powerful thing that can enter into your brain and it can change the way you think and the way you feel and the way you act. So do you think that the Bible writers understood why it was so important to feed your mind on God's word? It has the same capacity, the same mystical way of changing who you are, your thoughts about things, your reactions to stuff. What matters to you can all be changed by engaging the Word. That's why the Bible said this, this thing is living, it's alive, and it's powerful, and it has the capacity to do something to you unlike anything else. Listen to this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The scriptures are the great agency and the transformation of character. Christ prayed, sanctify them through the truth, for thy word is truth. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the hearts of doing every unholy attribute. This is sumptuous fair, my friends. This is something that we have forgotten all about. How much do we need to feed on it? Deuteronomy 6. Listen to this verse 6 through 9. Moses knew. He's pulling them out of a pagan society. And the Exodus has taken place. For 400 years, they have been inundated with all kinds of words and magic and spells. And, and they have become almost like the people all around them. So Moses said, let's start all over. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And they shall teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in your house and when you walk up, wake up and when you go by the way and when you lay down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon thy hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and they shall write them upon the post of the house and on your gates. And the foolish Jews thought, oh, that means we need to take these phylacteries, these little boxes and put the word of God literally on us and walk around with the box of their head. And on their wrist. And they missed the meaning of this. They missed the whole idea. We can contextualize that today. What, what God is saying is, and what Moses was saying to them, when you wake up in the morning and you turn over and you go to grab that phone, don't you dare look at Facebook. You go to the Scriptures first. Amen. And when you get up and you walk out and you sit down on your kitchen table and, you, and you're getting ready to have breakfast, to open your eyes and get rid of the bowl of fruit on the wall and put a picture with a with a say a text or, a, or something that reminds you about God. And when you go over the bathroom and you get dressed and you're brushing your teeth, have a post-it note on there of your favorite text that helps you. And when you get in your car, have it hanging off of your rearview mirror, a Bible text, and turn on the radio where you listen to the Bible. And when you sit down at work at your desk or you open your toolbox, let there be the Word of God there. And you look at it often throughout the day and you do that in reverse and when you go to bed. But the last thing your mind hears is God's Word. That's what Moses is saying. Because he understood the foul, weak, broken character. He understood how weak we are, how forgetful we are. And he knew that the Word of God was given to us as a living document. It's alive. That phone that you're glued to has no power in it at all. And yet it holds us captive. It is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. Can we stop right there? It is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. This is the same vital union that is represented by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. The words of Christ are spirit and life. Receiving them, you receive the life of the vine. You live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in Him, living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ. You bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. The world understands this. Satan understands it. That's why Barnes & Noble is so popular. You can go there and hear whatever words you want to hear. I, I went there... <laughs> I went to this uh, one Barnes and Noble's Mary album. We was up in Indiana doing this last series, and I was just blown away. Mary went, 
does that say what I think it is? I said, yes, that says exactly. It was the whole aisle and it end cap and it was like practicing the Wiccan arts. This wasn't even hidden away. It was like right there. And it was like, and there was another aisle of all these self-help books and it was really crass language. How to blankety blank fix yourself. And that was the whole series of this book, so this nasty word, how to quit, you know, feeling bad about yourself. How to, and I asked this guy, I said, man, oh, oh, what, is, what are, do these books sell? He says, yes, this stuff sells all the time. I said, what age group? Oh, 35 and less. What age group is missing from the church? 35 and less. Well, you know what? If Jesus was here, some say and we could speak to God directly like Moses, I'd live a different life. But do you know the, the, the numbers of people that actually have spoke to God and heard his literal word in all the people that's ever lived? It's so minute. It's, you can't even measure it. It's so minute. Only a few people in the history of mankind have actually held literal conversation with God. He spoke the word of God, the book Desire of Ages, as he had spoken through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ and the Savior desired to fix the faith of his followers on the Word. When his visible presence should be withdrawn, the Word must be their source of power. Like their master, they were to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In this part of Desire of Ages, it's all talking about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a scholar. He was a Hebrew scholar. This guy had the highest PhD that you could get. He would have had the entire Old Testament. Think about that. The entire Old Testament memorized by heart. Nicodemus. To be a rabbi of his stature. He would have known poetry. Of the scriptures. He would have known proper hermeneutics. He would have known all the ins and outs. And yet Jesus said to him, How is it that you are a teacher in Israel and cannot understand these simple things? Nicodemus received the lesson and carried it with him. He searched the scriptures in a new way. Not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul, he began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. This great scholar, once he understood what Jesus was trying to say to him, that the word of God is not just theory, it's not just theology, it's not just trying to figure out things. It is a document, it is a doorway, it is entering into relationship with him. That's hard for us to get. It's a little mystical, I know. But that's what it says. We enter into Christ through the Word because the Word gets in the mind and the mind then goes upward. Like it did for me this morning. Mary on her way to church this morning. I noticed she was over there weeping. I was, what did I do? <laughs> and she couldn't only talk. She said, I was reading Nehemiah. A Sabbath school lesson this morning trying to catch up on it. And it was talking about all the things that God had done for his people. And yet we said, these be our gods. And then all of the things that God has done for us. And yet we turn from you again. And all the things that God has done for his people. And then yet God still had mercy and love. And that word touched her heart this morning. This is what this thing can do. And this is no little issue. In 2017, George Barnum came and spoke to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a Reach the World conference. And he said, brothers and sisters, Christianity is in a crisis. And you Adventists are included in this new study. Here was his new study. Barnum then announced that statistically a very small amount of younger people have what is called a biblical worldview. Only 4% of 18 to 30 year olds and 7% of 30 to 49 year olds, that means every guy by my age and under, less than 12% of 50 and under today have a biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? It doesn't mean that they don't believe in the Bible. 
A biblical worldview means it's the lens from which I make decisions of my life. It is the lens by which I decide and work and think. If the Bible tells me turn left, I turn left. I don't say, well, I want to turn right. In other words, I filter everything through this scripture before I choose, before I think, before I act. It is my life. It is what I live by. That's a biblical worldview. doesn't mean I do it perfectly. But it means it's always there telling me, ah, no, ah, yes. 50% of our church, 50 and under, 12%. Have a biblical worldview. The rest do not. That is 75% of 50 and under. Do not live by this in that way. He researched and then turned his attention squarely to parents. Offering a statistical call to parental responsibility. He pointed out that while children from their worldview. Form their worldview by the age of 13. This is scary. Only 5% of parents with children from 5 to 13. Have a biblical worldview. This is terrifying. You wonder why we're always arguing and disunity and because what is a non-biblical worldview? It means what I think, what I feel, what my culture is, what my sense of whatever right and wrong is. I am the word of God. My own thoughts. You heard Dr. Nedley last week. My own feelings. Is what I filter everything through. And that's why the church is in such a struggling position right now. Because it's not what the word says. It's what I say. At least 75% of 50 and under. What is the biblical worldview? Man shall not live by feelings alone. Man shall not live by culture alone. Man shall not live by what he thinks alone. Man shall not live by what his professor teaches him. Man shall not live by what the radio says or what television says. Man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. And how can we do it if we don't know it or have never read it or very rarely do? It is the problem in the church and nothing else. How do we get a biblical worldview? You already know. How do you develop a biblical worldview? I'm not saying force your kids to Bible study. I'm not saying that at all. That didn't go too well for me either. But I'm saying that the biblical worldview comes when we begin to feed upon this word. Ephesians. I'm telling you, I want to make this attractive to you because I'm still not sure what this text means either. But I know that I want whatever this text is. Ephesians 3, verse 19. I'm going to let y'all get there. If you got a Bible, or if it's on your phone, please go there. This is what the Word of God is offering you today. So this is the payoff for abiding. Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Here comes the it comes how? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What in the world does that mean? Do you think that that might be an exciting life, young people? To be filled with all the fullness of God? <laughs> this actual real being that does exist, that has created everything, that is all powerful. Not some guy flying around in tights and a cape. But an actual being that has power and majesty. To be filled with his fullness. Whatever that means. This is what scripture is offering you. If you'll engage it. He will fill you with his fullness. And who knows what you could do. Because one thing is true. Most of you are not going to be rich. Most of you are not going to go on. And be powerful NBA players. Or football players. Or soccer players. The millennials know it. They know that the wealth of the world. Is captured by less than 1%. They know that they can't get there. In fact, millennials are looking for meaning outside of money. They're entire, listening to an entire program about it. They're looking for another meaning because they know they're not going to have the American dream. This is a dream, I'm telling you. Amen. This is something that can ignite, enlighten something within you that you can't see right now. That will bring a fulfillment, a joy, a contentment, a power. A, I can't. I don't have words. 
Not for this stuff. I woke up this morning without words to describe what was going on in my heart. I kind of like to liken it to New Start experience. The three years I worked out there in California as the chaplain for the New Start program, a lifestyle place where people go. They come there for 18 days from all over the world, sick, fat, and nearly dead. And they get there and they got usually type 2 diabetes or some kind of heart disease or obesity or high blood pressure, gout, to skin condition, I mean, you name it. And the doctors do something very radical. They put them on a plant-based diet Amen. for 18 days along with water and fresh air and sunlight and exercise. But the main focal point is that diet. And they put them on that. One thing I saw in three years now, there are some exceptions to the rules. There's some diseases that it helped but didn't cure. But type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, many of these other things. Within 18 days, I see miracles. I've seen people lose 20 pounds, 30 pounds. I saw people off of their high blood pressure medicine. I've seen them turn around their type 2 diabetes. I've seen them get off their metformin. I've watched them walking and feeling good and the blood flow back to their face. And it was amazing. If I could liken the, the, the plant-based diet to reading your word of God, that's what I'm trying to say. For 18 days, if you begin to read your word of God for any amount of time that you choose, let's just say a week, you're going to ingest yourself. You're going to have healing in your life. You're going to have blessings. You're going to feel something. Things are going to change. There was another group at New Start that came there, and someone usually paid their way. They wasn't really invested in it. They got there, they looked at the food, and they're like, oh, I have no way. They can't eat this. And, and they were miserable, and they didn't live out the program. They didn't let the diet work in their life. And they left there as sick as when they came. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a text from back at New Start since I've left, and even when I were there, of a person that came to the program, went on home, and died. If we continue to live lives devoid of the word of God, we will continue to have the same results that we've had as a church, as a people, in the family, in your marriage. We've got to do something different. And I know that it's, that it's difficult. One of the guys that came there, he was from, a, he, he had a chain of fast food restaurants. And the guy, you could tell, had done more than just run them. <laughs> And he was only, you know, younger than I am. And he was nearly, he was about to die. This dude was in bad shape. He couldn't hardly walk. He was overweight. His blood pressure was through the roof. Type 2 diabetes, all that metabolic syndrome stuff. I mean, he was just a wreck. And I remember sitting down at the, at the lunch table like the second day with him. And he started telling me, I just don't know if I can ever go without a Carl's Jr. again. Chains and rent. Like 20 of them all over California. And he started describing to me the burger, how it felt when he put it in his hands. How his taste buds and his mouth would begin to water and the juice would bite into it and the grease, the taste in the mouth and, and the sesame seeds and the onions and the bread and the bacon and the cheese. And it just all how it felt. So to eat it and the french fries and crispy and salty and then you got that burning Dr. Pepper go down your throat and then you do it again. And, and then back and you just feel some endorphins and, and all the endorphins and the things and the dopamine just go crazy in the brain and you're feeling so good. And then he looked at that pile of salad and the hummus and he said, it, uh, he did that. I said, I hope oh, Dr. Gallant don't see that. But you know what? Here's what I've noticed with people that did that. And him included. That just after 18 days, they put you on a three-day fast there. They cleanse the palate, they call it. Reset in the brain. And then at the end of 18 days, the taste buds has changed. And they're eating peas for breakfast. Beans at every meal. Right, Miss Mary. <laughs> they're eating salads, carrots, raw food, and they walk away. And their testimony, graduation night, is always this. I can't believe it. I can't believe I can actually know now that I can live without pizza again because I like my food. I like it. And that is exactly what 
the relationship with Christ is demanding of you. I know that this compared to screens, this compared to movies, this compared to the world is like, bleh. I need my burger. But you cleanse your palate. You take time and make yourself eat what you don't want to eat. And in a fast amount of time, you watch how you start not being able to get away from this word. You watch how you will start having it in your life. You'll start craving the stories. You watch for the very first time that you read something and you weep when you read it. Now you're having relationship. Now he's speaking to you. When you go to do something and a Bible text pops in your mind out of nowhere, that's not coincidence. That's the word. It's in here and it's coming out when you need it. And it is God saying, hey, Damon, love thy enemy. This is what I'm trying to tell you. If you want to stay in the will of faith, if you want to have a transformed life, if you want a different life, then you've got to eat different. And you've got to eat at least as much as you eat at home. Consistently. And your life will change. I know it to be true. I know this to be true. James chapter 1 verse 21 says it this way. Oh man, listen to James. He knows the story. He's all about works, right? This guy, Luther, hated this guy. He says, say, let's do this. James chapter 1, verse 20. James 1, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The Bible is implanted when you read it, when you eat it. It's what Jesus meant. You take my word, you ingest it, you eat it. It's implanted and it becomes a living, a living thing within you that can change and transform your life. And he would go on and say, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a, a doer. When you hear it, you do. And it'll get easier to do. The more you do, the more you want to hear that's James in the holy place in the Hebrew sanctuary. There was a table there. As we wrap it up, I want you to think about this. There was a table there. And you know what was on the table in the holy place? It was two stacks of bread. And we call them the table of showbread. But it was actually called the, the face of his presence. The word, the, the bread was a symbol of the presence of God. And when you ingested the, the bread, it was a symbol of, of God's presence. To eat that bread was to be in his presence. And Jesus made the tie clearly that I am the bread of life. And when you ingest me, when you eat me, when you take me in, it's the face of his presence. You are having, you're having a relationship with him. You're in his presence. And this is the only way that we've got to enter into that presence. And, and across from the table of showbread was the candelabra that lit up. It was the symbol of the Spirit of God, the divine presence. And then right there in front of the altar, of the curtain, was the altar of incense called the golden altar. And this golden altar, it represented the prayers, right? The prayers of the saints. The symbolism is perfect in the holy place. When you open the Word of God, when you read it, when you listen to it, you get into this thing, the divine presence, the illumination of God lightens the heart. And when the prayers erupt out of the soul from the word that you put in, the Holy Spirit takes them to God and God answers those prayers. All predicated upon the word. An old famous country gospel song of mine that I love. Every time I hear it, it breaks my heart. I went into a home one day just to see some friends of mine. Of all their books and magazines, not a Bible could I find. I asked them for the Bible. When they brought it, what a shame. For the dust was covered o'er it. Not a 
fingerprint was plain. Just on the Bible, just on the Holy Word, the words of all the prophets and the sayings of our Lord, of all the other books you'll find, there's none salvation holds. Get the dust off the Bible and redeem your poor soul. The book of Revelation to the Laodicean church, chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is him knocking. And if any man answers, if any man opens that door, I will come in. And I will dine with him and he with me. This is that door. He's knocking. It has to be up to you from now on to start opening and ingesting this living word. So here's my challenge to you. The next seven days, please, for God's sake, turn off the world. Forget about what's going on in the government. Forget about the sports world. You do this. For the next week, you deliberately attempt and try with all your soul to abide in Him through the Word. And you take Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 through 9. Go back and read it. And you try that for the next seven days. Maybe you'll want to come to prayer meeting now because you have something that you can't help but to say. Maybe you'll want to come to Sabbath school because you have something to share about Nehemiah. Maybe you'll want to come to the Abide group because you're a young person and now you've been reading. You want to share. Maybe you'll come to the Friday night meeting because you want to know more of this word. I don't know how it will impact you, but I know this it will impact you. But you, Mino, 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 imperative, you must make that choice and you must open this and you must put it in your heart. And God will in turn bless you, I promise. Let's have prayer for you. Our Father in heaven, we hold up this living word. We know that it is the power of God into salvation revealed in its pages. It is the power of God into the Holy Spirit and sanctification. It is the power of God in our lives to the Laodicean church. God, as my friends decide to open this word, I pray that you would not play around, but that you would immediately and mightily Show them what you're trying to say and bless any man, any woman, any young person that decides to have a relationship with you through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.